Hello, and welcome to the channel where I talk about a few of my favourite things. Swords and their related blade siblings. Now, why bladed and edged weapons in particular? Well, the long answer is that I've always been fascinated by the contrast between us creating these beautiful, like amazingly designed um, works of art and the way they become these cultural icons and things that are really, really important to us in, um, in our culture, in our pop culture, in our media, and the fact that they were basically used to murder and conquer each other, um, and how interesting that is. Um, <laughs> the short answer is also that just swords and their related blade siblings are simply awesome. Uh, just like there's nothing about them that I don't find absolutely fascinating, um, and I could talk about them all day, hence this channel. Yeah, I mean, I fence, I study them, uh, yes, I study the blade. <laughs> I study them, I draw them, uh, I have an all-around unhealthy obsession with them, and my job as a channel is to drag you down with me, or, you know, I mean, educate you about these incredible objects, stories, and what they still mean to us now. So, let's go. And we're going to start with basically the L words of Axis. That's right, the Libris. And how the Libris, in particular, came to become a lesbian feminist icon. Um, so, Libris itself means double-headed axe in Greek. If you close your eyes and you picture essentially your cartoon version of an axe with two little wings on either side, well, that's it. You basically just imagined a Libris with the power of cartoons. So we haven't all handled an axe before, sadly. I'd really love to handle an axe, maybe one of my number one goals after lockdown, which is a bit concerning. <laughs> but we all know what's generally useful, right? For cutting down wood, for harvesting timber, for having a go at your enemies. It's multi-purpose. Also, axe throwing is making a comeback, apparently. So maybe you want to add that to your post-lockdown list. It is online. But let's have a look at where the original libraries came from. From Minoan civilization. So a civilization from the Bronze Age um, that was settled on the island of Crete in Greece. Here's a shiny example of a gold Minoan libraries um, from the archaeological museum in Heraklion. So, as you can imagine, fighting with a gold weapon is incredibly counterintuitive. Plus, you'd get, like, blood and detailing, it'd be a nightmare to clean up, ugh. So, we can guess these ones were not meant for fighting or for harvesting, unless you're an extremely extra farmer, but more for ceremonial purposes, since they were associated with the Minoans' many gods. Uh, but not just any gods, and not specifically male gods, but goddesses. And sometimes including the mother goddess, the central final boss goddess who represents life itself. Here's a picture of a Minoan goddess I found earlier. Uh, I didn't find it myself, you know, I found a picture online on the internet, but you get what I mean. Um, the image itself comes from the Minoan moles of Palai Castro that also kept at the Archaeological Museum of Heraklion. So as you can see, she has two axes and she looks pissed off. As representations of other Minoan goddesses um, feature one that may be my favourite, um, she's holding two snakes, and plot twist, she's also topless. Um, so, you know, big power move. You do not want to mess with this woman on any day. So we can gather that the Libris represents heaven. Heaven? What? No. Oh. So we can gather that the Libris represents harvest and the earth. Um, but not only. And that's when the origin of words becomes fun. Or even more fun. Because, <laughs> because another word for um, double-headed axe in Greek is pelikis. And what's Greek term for lightning? Astropeliki, like basically star axe. Uh, and the Minoans decorated some of their libraries with um, these stylized zigzag lightning motifs. And there's already an association between axes and deities who could control lightning. So if you were a mother goddess and you were shown holding a double axe, that would show that you control not only the earth, but also the sky. So you're just like an overall badass, like even more so than when you just had a double axe, you know, which is already pretty, pretty badass. And plus also there's some implication that you've also handled snakes while topless. So that's a whole thing you've got going on. Okay, just wanted to add, this focus on powerful goddesses seems to reflect Minoan society, but it comes to findings suggest they had public responsibilities were linked to religious functions and were not reduced to, say, motherhood or the home. Some historians even interpret Minoan civilization as possibly a matriarchy. A lot of archaeology is also shaped by gender bias, and my sources are full of historians fighting with each other about this, and hey. Even Mother Goddess is a bit of a bias from some of my sources, which of course I realised after shooting the video. <laughs> you live and learn. Yeah, she could be a symbol of life and fertility, but she could also have many more meanings, which we can't really interpret for sure. So, mysterious, ambiguous, and also a badass. 
Moving on from the Minoans and getting to know the ancient Greeks. Um, later on, some different Greek gods um, and goddesses are given Lebrises or Lebri. Or I haven't checked the plural of Lebris, and I should have before starting this video. Um, some, yeah. <laughs> one Lebris each. Yes, exactly one Lebris each. Um, that includes Zeus, ruler of the gods on Mount Olympus, control of lightning, which is where the axe comes in handy um, in terms of symbolism. Um, and also resident pervert, which has nothing to do with anything else, but, you know, I just thought you should know. I don't like Zeus, and he's just, like, such a pervert, um, just such a bad guy, just even linked to, kind of, ideas of morality in ancient Greek gods. Like, essentially, none of them are really good guys, uh, but he's even worse than the rest, in my opinion. Okay, rant about Zeus, over. The only story I like about Zeus, and that's also relevant Lebris wise is that one day he had a splitting headache after swallowing his pregnant wife, Metis, because he was scared the child would overthrow him. What a guy! He's in such pain that he orders someone to chop his head open with our friend, the Lebris, and out pops his daughter, Athena, goddess of wisdom, in full armour. So, Athena's the best, and I'm very sad there's no actual evidence that um, the Lebris was one of her attributes although you know she's goddess of war so she probably handled one at some point right but i can't find any proof of that but it's kind of interesting to see that there's this link between the Lebris and the origin story of yet another um powerful goddess um another goddess who's associated with the double axe and Lebris is demeter uh, who's goddess of the harvest so there's this direct link right between the Lebris as the symbol of the earth and the harvest and um, Demeter having one. Yay. Good for Demeter. I like Demeter. <laughs> this has become like a ranking of which go gods and goddesses um, from ancient Greek mythology Claire likes or not. There's also records of uh, Libris being given as offerings to Artemis, who is the goddess of uh, the moon and hunt. And she's also ranked <laughs> as goddesses I not only like, but it's also uh, in my ranking of um, Greek goddesses most likely to be lesbians. Um, for a number of reasons. First, she's a virgin, so like in kind of ancient Greek culture, boiling it down really, really essentially, she's not really linked uh, to any man. Um, she also has a very large following of beautiful naked nymphs, which is less like, good for you, Artemis, you go. Good for her. Um, and also there's um, at least one story of her um, killing a man who saw her naked. Um which is, you know, maybe why she's been given so many axe offerings. Just like, her followers are like, you know what, Artemis, you know, just in case you come across another guy and you're naked and you feel vulnerable, here's an axe. <laughs> Who else is recorded to really, really enjoy um, double axes and are also brutal um, girl power icons? That's right, the Amazons. Yeah, we love the Amazons. We have no reason to hate the Amazons. They're just all around awesome. Um, and I really like this depiction of an Amazon on a mosaic that's kept at the Louvre Museum, not only because it proves <laughs> my research on um, Amazons being associated with double-headed axe, but also because the horse, like the Amazon's horse, is just really, really relatable. That horse's face is just like an entire mood. So another interesting point about Amazons and the Brits um, is that, you know, so you know Hercules, um, Greek hero, the 12 tasks, um, has a Disney film, uh, <laughs> which is not accurate at all, but it's just pretty great. It's maybe one of my favorite Disney films. Um, one of the 12 tasks that isn't shown and cut out of the kid friendly version um, is that one of uh, Hercules's or Heracles in Greek's um, tasks is to recover um, a libris, um, as well as a girdle and um, a whole other thing from the Queen of the Amazons, Hippolyte, uh, which he does after killing her. So, you know, another reason why that was kept out of the Disney version. Um, but that proves that, you know, there's there's more than like a passing connection between the Libris and the Amazons. Yay. OK, quick correction. It's actually the other way around. His nice task is to get the girdle. Um, but then he also gets the Libris. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, right? Like if you could get Libris instead of getting a girdle, what would you choose? Also, apologies to Disney's Hercules, um, because they do reference um, that task. Uh, Philoctetes, voiced by Danny DeVito, um, mentions it on one of the missions that Herc has to go to next. So there you go. Also, great film. Completely inaccurate, but great film. 
Staying with ancient Greek heroes, another famous story is the story of the Trojan War, or the Iliad, as told by Homer. <laughs> no, not that Homer, but although it's just really, really fun to me to imagine Homer Simpson reciting the Iliad in that exact voice. So let's just stick with that mental image. Um, the Trojan War, in a tiny nutshell, um, essentially um, a big epic war is being fought um, between the Greeks and the Trojans over the beautiful Helen of Troy. Um, she's been stolen away to well, Troy. So, like, basically, she was Helen before, and now she becomes Helen of Troy um, by Prince Paris, uh, away from her husband, Melanos. Problem is, um, all the Greek um, kings who essentially um, were requesting Helen's hand in marriage before she chose Melanos decided to um, pledge an oath that whoever Helen chose um, and um, chose to be her husband, um, all the Greek um kings who had um, basically asked for her hand in marriage uh, would have to pledge to defend that guy um, if ever something happened to Helen. Um, so it's just basically once that whole situation happened, there were most Greek heroes or kings and anybody of interest who was asking for Helen's hand were like, oh shit, well, it's no, we got to go fight this war now. Uh, <laughs> and one of these people is Agamemnon, um, the King Agamemnon, cool name. Uh, who has a wife, Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra. Yes, I succeeded. Um, she is sister of Helen, and but she's not very happy when Agamemnon finally returns from the Trojan War um, for several reasons. First, she has her own lover um, situation going on, so that's kind of awkward. Um, secondly, uh, Agamemnon also brings back um, Cassandra, Princess of Troy, as a war tr- kind of war trophy, like his prize. Um, yeah, a real progressive. Just women as currency. <laughs> it's ancient Greece. Um, so what does uh, what does Clytemnestra do about this whole situation? Well, um, allegedly, <laughs> according to certain stories, like this is not just I'm not saying allegedly because it's a murder case or a murder investigation. Um, it's more that like there's different stories and some of the details are different in some of those retellings of that story, but. Allegedly, she picks up a double axe and she murders Agamemnon, um, along with Cassandra in some stories as well. Um, and she is pictured here in this painting by John Collier from 1882 that's been kept at Guildhall Art Gallery in London. Uh, you can see her with her double axe and an expression that's perfectly normal for someone who's murdered her entire family, at least. Plot twist. In some stories, Clytemnestra's first husband before Agamemnon is the king of Lydia. Um, who was handed down from his ancestor Omphale, an ancient Libris. In fact, the same one Heracles stole from the Queen of the Amazons. Boom. It's all connected. So, despite being associated with um, other male gods sometimes, especially lightning gods, the Libris mainly remains a representation of not only ancient powerful goddesses, um, but also to some extent powerful women and the matriarchy in general. It has appeared in the 30s and 40s where it managed to be co-opted by Greek and French fascists as a symbol, so it had that not going for it. It had that awkward fascist period in, it, in its history. Um, but then it rebrands in the 70s. Yeah, there's kind of this new age wave of pagan practices that take up and celebrate ancient matriarchal symbols and goddesses. And so the Libris is in the mix. Um, this kind of morphs into the Libris becoming this feminist symbol of strength and empowerment. And then that is um, that kind of trickles down and leads to it being co-opted by um, lesbians as a you know lesbian activist symbol. And this earring from 1999 from the Museum of London shows how the Libris could be a political activist statement, but also a way of making yourself visible um, to other lesbians in your area. And like honestly, wouldn't you want to go uh, for a girl with an axe? whether it's like a cool earring or like just like a life-size axe. It's just like the dream girl, right? Also, I like the idea that lesbians um, just went all out in the fictional meeting for LGBTQ symbols. Uh, it's just like, oh, okay, so we have a beautiful rainbow flag, the whole LGBTQ community, and we've got these this just like beautiful design and the colours represent life, healing, sunlight, nature, harmony, and spirit. Hey, lesbians, do you want, like, a, an extra symbol thrown out just for you? Yeah, yeah, we want an act. Ooh. Right. Yep, yep. Cool, cool, cool. We're not gonna, we're not gonna fight with you on this because now you have an act, yeah? 
Yeah, we're pissed off about representations. Now, guess what? We just get giant X. Does it represent anything in particular? Yeah, it shows we're pissed off. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I love it. In 1999, um, graphic designer Sean Campbell designs a lesbian feminist flag with the Libris. So the backdrop is color violet, uh, referring to the violet flower as a lesbian symbol via the ancient Greek um, poetess and um, extraordinary lesbian Sappho. She wrote many, many poems about being gay for girls in her time on the island of Lesbos. Yeah, which led to lesbian. Amazing. Um, and it's all really, really relatable, um, including one about a lost love wearing a garland of violet tiaras, braided rosebuds, dill and crocus. The Labrys is at the centre of an inverted black triangle, um, which was used by Nazis in concentration camps um, to label um, people with visual symbol for antisocial behaviour. And while there's some conflicting sources on that, um, it's generally thought that um, lesbians were also um, labelled with that same um, anti-social behaviour symbol. So the flag was first used in 2000 on in Pride issue of the Gay and Lesbian Times newspaper. It's really interesting and powerful to me um, to think that um, we've got these two um, symbols that were either created or reclaimed in the fascist context, and then they were managed to be re-reclaimed on the lesbian feminist flag as a symbol of resilience and empowerment um, and kind of resistance against oppression. And that's just yeah, that's just really, really cool to me, and it just shows how how much these symbols kind of change and like the ambiguity and the history and, and kind of sometimes messy um, origins of these symbols. And there you have it, the girl power story of the libraries that you didn't ask for. All my sources for this video are in the description down below, as well as all the objects I mentioned. If you like this video, um, let me know by commenting, rating, subscribing and liking this video. <laughs> I'm trying to do social media stuff. Either way, you can find me on social media, and you can also check out the podcast I'm doing, Bustles and Broadswords, about badass women with swords throughout history. I also have a webcomic on Webtoon called Girls' School of Knighthood, so if you like stories about girls with swords, um, with swashbucklery, cloak and dagger stuff, queerness, then check it out. And if you want to support me in um, making all this content, you can do so on Patreon. From $1, you get access to lots of cool stuff, including exclusive drawings, research notes, and a newsletter. Stay safe, sword lovers, and see you in the next video.